Hey you guys, Tiffany here. I just want to give you guys a forewarning before I get into today's video. The subject of today is, of course, uh, the chicken nuggets. As you know, we raised a batch of uh, Cornish Cross meat chickens. And um, over this past weekend, we had a, a bit of a hurricane scare. And we've been delayed on uh, actually uh, processing them, I will say. But uh, we, with the hurricane scare, we needed to get them processed. So today's video is about our first experience uh, butchering, for lack of a better word, uh, our meat chickens. So if you, if that's not something you are interested in hearing about, or if you're squeamish, now is the time to go ahead and back. As I just said, we had a hurricane scare over the past weekend. Uh, Tropical Storm Isaiah came through and it kind of fluctuated back and forth between uh, being a hurricane and a tropical storm. So with that in mind, um, we had a flock of Cornish Cross meat chickens running and um, we started out with 25 that we had gotten as chicks and we got them from Valley, I think it was Valley Farms Hatchery or something like that. Um, I'll leave a link down below onto that hatchery that we used. But um, had a pretty good experience, of course, as every hatchery does. They sent they sent us an extra chick. Um, Cornish Cross. If you've raised Cornish Cross before, you know that they can be a finicky breed. They are um, you you tend to lose them just because they're genetically bred to grow so fast. So. Uh, from the get-go, unfortunately, we did lose one chick as a small chick, and we had a few ups and downs here and there along the way. Well, I think we ended up with, in the end, 19 to 20 uh, chickens to process. Um, we did pay a little bit of extra money to get all males, because, of course, males uh, get to be much bigger than females. Here we are, a big day of processing. Um, it was a Friday because... The hurricane was supposed to hit us over the weekend, so I tried to get everything set up as best I could. Davis was at work, so I had to uh, get the processing started by myself, which was not an issue. Uh, we had to go out to the pasture because I wanted to do them in, in our backyard of our house, and they're currently they were currently being uh, housed out of our pasture. So the day started off with me and Leon going and getting the chickens from the pasture, loading them up in the trailer, and bringing them home. Um, I think in total the setup that we had was very uh, simple. Um, we had, of course, uh, we didn't have a kill cone because we were trying to not spend as much money as possible. We were trying to keep the budget very low on processing day with us getting ready to build a house and the shutdown and everything like that. We tried to keep the expenses as minimal as possible. So we used a hay string in lieu of a kill cone. Um, I could not find large pots for an affordable price. Um, there weren't any turkey fryers available for us to have the pot in the burner. So we ended up finding a used old beat up turkey fryer pot at a uh, farm at the, the flea market. And so I got that for really cheap and we ended up setting it up on a fire on top of bricks that we use around our fire pit. That was a little bit difficult but it did save us some money in the long run. So did that. Of course you need a thermometer for regulating the temperature. And then we had um, the processing station with the table. I had some fillet knives that I used for um, that were sharpened for that. And then of course buckets for waste. Um, I did get our uh, bags for storing the chickens uh, from, um, actually ordered them off of Amazon. They were uh, poultry shrink bags and I got a 50 pack of those. So we had those. We did not use a chicken plucker uh, or a poultry plucker. I, I wish we would have, but the prices on them right now is just so insane. So we will down the road, whenever we get the house built and the next time we do raise meat chickens, we're gonna either buy or build a poultry plucker. So. That's definitely in the plans. So we brought the chickens home. Um, you guys might be wondering because our son Leon participates in a lot of the farm activities. No, Leon was not a part of this process. I asked him if he wanted to. I gave him that decision and let him decide if he wanted to be a part of it because it is, it's an emotional experience and he is very sensitive and I know that he loves the farm animals. And so he said, he said that he didn't really want to because he would, and I, and I asked him because I do want to know where he is mentally 
And so I asked us, like, why do you not want to? And he said, because I don't think I could handle it. And I said, well, what do you think you could not handle? Could you not handle the blood and guts? Or could you not handle it because you'd be sad? And he said, I would be sad. And I said, that's okay. I said, that's good that you're sad. Because that means you care. And I feel like whenever you are processing any kind of livestock, if you don't feel sad on processing day, then there's something wrong with you. And so I explained to him that it is good to be sad, that it is healthy, and that it's actually good that he's sad at the process passing of the meat chickens because he values that life. Whereas, like, you feel sad to process the chickens. It's a good thing, it's a happy, it's a celebratory thing. And I explained to him, I was like, I am, I personally am sad to process the chickens and to see them go. And I said, but I'm also happy. And he said, why? And I said, because that means we have food. We have, not only do we have food, we have food that came from chickens that we knew lived a good life, that were healthy and happy and were raised on a pasture instead of in confined places like in buildings that you tend to see uh, most commercially raised chicken raised in. The, the conditions that they're raised under, it's just not, I don't personally feel like it's right ethically. I feel like a chicken should be able to range on the grass. And so, I feel like we had a very good conversation, but I told him, I was like, if you don't want to be a part of it, that's okay. You don't have to. I'm not going to force you to. I want him to be emotionally, mentally prepared and ready because that is an, it is an emotional experience. So he was not part of this, um, this, this part, but he was interested and intrigued and wanted to be a part of the actual dressing of the chicken so he could learn the anatomy and see all the different organs and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, you know what? That's a great start. So later on in the story, he came, he comes back in. So got home, got everything set up, um, got the first chicken in the hay string. Um, there are multiple methods of dispatching chickens. I personally uh, decided to go with the bleed out method because that was the method that I was most confident in. Um, and what the bleed out method is basically is where you suspend them upside down, it puts them into a sedated state and you use a very sharp knife, keyword very sharp knife, the saying goes a sharp knife is a humane knife, and um, you, you basically come in on, I think it's their left side of under the chin, um, the jawbone, and you slit the jugular, and you let them bleed out and they pass. While it is peaceful, the body does shake as the blood is leaving their body. So. It's not just like a, oh, they just go to sleep and there's no movement, there is twitching and it, if you're not prepared, it is very freaky. But, um, so, and I think that's where the kill cone kind of comes into play because they're kind of like secured, you don't really see that in a kill cone. Down the road we do plan on getting a kill cone, but for this case the hay string worked fine. Um, the other methods that I've heard of are um, a cervical dislocation which is, or I think spinal dislocation, but I can't remember what exactly, but basically you break their neck, and that sounds very violent, um, but you take like a broomstick and you hold it over the, top, the back of their head and you take them by the feet and you just do a very quick jerk up and it dislocates the spine. And it's supposed to kill them very, very peacefully, even more than the um, bleed out method. But here's the kicker and the reason why I'm not so confident in this method is because I've heard stories where people have done it and instead of putting the animal down, it paralyzes them and they're not dead. And I'm just, I'm not confident in my abilities to do that effectively and I just do not want the animal to suffer. The other, the the other one that I've heard of is of course the most common one that you hear from old times is the chalk block method. And if you don't know what that is, that is essentially where you lay the chicken down on a chalk block and you just chop their head off. And let me tell you, I definitely learned under these uh, um, researching where the story is running around like a chicken with your head cut off comes from. That is a real thing. Because the nerves, it's, it's, it's not because the chicken is like feeling it, it's because the nerves are running around. That, that, that's, that's basically what it is. It's, it's just the nerves. But, um, so we decided to go with the bleed out method. So, bled them out, hanging them upside down. 
Uh, you're supposed to let them rest for three minutes to let the blood fully drain out. So I did that, removed the head, and then brought it over to the pot. Now this is where I um, kind of encountered the most difficult part of this whole process. Not emotionally, just uh, technically. And um, I think the most difficult part was determining where the best temperature range was for properly scalding the chickens without cooking the chicken. Um, this is where my first errors came in. Um, we started off, one of the articles that I read said uh, 160 degrees for 20 seconds, and some articles said 145 to 150 degrees, some said 135 to 140. Um, mind you, I found these out later, so I didn't have those. So I went with 160 degrees because I thought that was it. And I don't know if maybe I shouldn't have done 20 seconds of dunking, but um, I dunked it, I pulled it out, feathers plucked off beautifully, but whenever I got it fully um, plucked, I could see that the chicken had cooked a little bit. Now, thankfully, um, I reached out to a Facebook group which is full of amazing, wonderful people who have so much knowledge and they're so willing to share it, and it's called the uh, Backyard Meat Chickens group on Facebook. I'll leave a link to that down below. I reached out to them and thankfully a lot of them said, it's not ruined, um, you just have to eat that first because it's not gonna store as long. So I was like, okay, thank God, I didn't just waste my first chicken that I just processed. So he was saved plucked his feathers, and um, then brought him over to the table. Uh, I think where we found, after proceeding forward with everything, uh, we found that 100, between 145 and 150 degrees, um, dunking for 20 seconds ended up working best for us. We had um, perfect, easy, easy plucking, non-cooked meat, and that went well. So still do some research, look into the different articles, and, and you come to that decision. That was just our personal, what we found. Um, like I said, I wish we had a plucker, but um, just not in the budget. This time around, down the road, we'll, like I said, either buy one or build one, and uh, we'll do that. I feel like it was a good thing for us to, to hand pluck for the first time, though. Uh, where I learned to process a chicken was actually through uh, Danelle with Weedem and Reap. She did an excellent video many years ago on how to uh, butcher a chicken, and um, she gave the simplest directions for actually dressing the chicken and removing the organs. I have to say my least favorite part of uh, dressing the chickens was removing the crop. It was very tedious and because you don't want to cut it, you have to go in and pull away the connective tissue and it was it was kind of a pain in the butt, I'm not gonna lie. So, but once I got past there, the rest of it was really not that bad. Very easy, very simple. Um, actually got Leon involved on the second day. Um, second day rolled around. I think on the first day, I ended up processing six birds by myself. Yes, go me. Um, and then the second day, Davis was off work and he, he got involved and uh, we kind of took up stations. Uh, he got the fire set up. We brought in the leaf blower, which was a huge help in getting the water temperature up quickly, whereas the first day where I just, you know, used my lungs and <laughs> starting the fire, it took me at least an hour to an hour and a half to get the water up to temperature. That that really delayed me. I probably would have gotten a lot more done that day if it didn't take me all that time to do that. But he had the blower, um, we got the pot up to temperature, he took care of dispatching, um, he learned how to dispatch, he learned how to dress, but we decided because, I mean, man hands, big hands, he didn't really have enough space to get into the cavity of the bird and remove the organs. So he took care of dispatch, scalding, and, I, and uh, plucking, and I took care of dressing, and then whenever I was finished dressing the chicken, I went over and helped him pluck the rest of the chicken, and then brought it over and continued. So, process the chicken, um, remove the organs. We just, of course, first and foremost, kept the chicken, and then we, uh, my mom loves chicken livers, so I kept and reserved the chicken livers for her. We kept the chicken necks and the chicken feet, both of those to make uh, chicken broth because they have a lot of good things in them. Some people keep the other organs like the heart, the gizzard. I'm not really an organ lover. I don't really eat that. Um, down the road when we are better set up, I do plan to keep those organs to grind up and feed to the dogs with their food because we don't want stuff to go to waste. But, because we weren't like really prepared to take on all that stuff and weren't set up yet, um, we elected to donate the waste, the heads, the organs that we didn't keep, all of that, to a local wildlife rescue where they have predators and things and they need meat to feed them and they wholeheartedly took them. So nothing went to waste, thankfully. We did learn that uh, 
On a side note, we did learn that you don't want to put the chicken directly in the freezer due to rigor mortis. You want to let it rest in um, either ice water or a fridge or a chest uh, for 48 hours. I think 24 to 48 hours. We went ahead and rested it for 48 hours just to make sure that and the reason for this is if you just put it directly in the freezer or you just go to eat it that same day, the meat's gonna be very tough because of rigor mortis. So doing this ensures a nice tender chicken. But um, it was a little bit of an emotional roller coaster. I definitely say the first one was was very difficult emotionally but it did get easier as it progressed and you kind of I don't want to say emotionally disconnect yourself but you put yourself in a mental space so to speak personally I'm glad we did it because the, the chicken in our freezer it's it's got a story to it I'm more emotionally tied to it like that chicken it has value to me whereas if you just go to a store and you pick up chicken it's just chicken you don't think twice about it whereas when you raise them you have a hand in that animal's care you have a hand in the processing at the end that chicken is it becomes more valuable to you and you respect it more so to speak I don't know if you can understand that but that is kind of how I personally feel and I'm glad we did it and we did it. I think this is gonna definitely be the way we do it from now on um, hopefully hopefully from here on out we never buy chicken from the store again unless we have to, unless we need to. So, and that just kind of adds on to our uh, list of sustainable things that we are growing on our farm. We've got the cows, we've got our beef, and now we've got the chickens. And hopefully here in, uh, at the beginning of November, we will also have the turkeys for our uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. So, I wanted to share that experience with you guys. Um, if you have any questions, uh, specifically that maybe something I didn't go over in the chicken butchering please leave it below I didn't want to do because this was our first time butchering chickens I didn't want to do a how-to video because we are learners but I did want to share the experience and things that we learned and like I said if you have any questions about anything specifically that we did please leave it down below in the comments and I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have I, I definitely want to share the knowledge that I have and hope that maybe it'll help you with your decision as to whether or not you want to do this or if you already are doing this and you're not sure of one of the processes or any of the things that you have to do, please let me know. We've got a fridge full of chicken resting now and um, now that they've been resting, I'm actually about to pop them in the freezer.